your darkness, bring all your light. What you gonna do with your precious life? Welcome beloveds to our virtual gathering of the West Side Unitarian Universalist Congregation on this heavy Sunday morning. I'm the Reverend Deanna Vandiver, your bridge minister. I serve here at West Side Unitarian Universalist Congregation in that capacity and as an affiliated community minister for love and liberation with our Church of the Larger Fellowship. And I'm honored to be leading worship this morning with Richard D. Ken. With a Master of Divinity, Richard Kem brings over seven years of professional experience engaging in a person-centered approach to engaging race, culture, and identity in various nonprofit and educational settings. Most recently, Richard worked as the Intercultural Credibility Coordinator Consultant at the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology, where he received his Master's in Divinity. Richard also holds a BS from the University of Minnesota. As a person born in the United States to parents who immigrated from South Korea, Richard brings an uncommon voice to the work of racial equity. Richard is a husband to Grace, and together they have two children. Richard is from Minnesota by way of Florida and has lived in the Seattle area since 2007. Richard, we are grateful you are with us this morning. Joining us behind the scenes, but making the scenes possible, is an extraordinary technical team made up of y'all, <laughs> making sure that this worship service is delivered to you virtually as gracefully as possible. Thank you. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever the color of your skin, whoever you love, however your body moves and your brain works, however you identify, you are welcome in this faith community. We gather together today from many locations and we take this time to particularly acknowledge that our congregation resides on the traditional territory of the Duwamish people. In this acknowledgement, we recognize the Duwamish heritage is imbued in the mountains, valleys, waterways, and shorelines that surround us all. May we nurture our relationships with our coastal Salish neighbors, especially the Duwamish people, and our shared responsibilities to this place. At this time, we are acutely aware of the traumatic history of pandemics brought through colonization on these native cultures and the traumatic impact it continues to cause. Let us take a moment to offer humble respect for this place and its peoples. Our opening words are from your bridge minister. Holy miracle, this moment made possible by mystery and courage. Countless decisions and encounters shaping our hearts and our lives, forming our faith and bringing us here to this particular moment in time and space to take a breath together, to witness the wonder and the grief of it all, to know that we are lovable, loved and capable of loving, to remember that we are all in this together an interdependent web connecting us beyond the limits of our knowing and perhaps our imaginations. Come beloveds, let us worship together. I invite you to rise in body or spirit for a chalice lighting hymn, Rise Up O Flame, number 362, led by Scott Farrell, the wonderful West Side UU music director. Rise up, O flame, by thy light glowing, show to us beauty, vision, and joy. Rise up, O flame, by thy light glowing, show to us beauty, vision, and joy. Rise up, O flame, by thy light glowing, 
glowing show to us beauty vision and joy may it be so in unitarian universalist congregations worldwide services began with the lighting of a chalice a flame within a chalice is a primary symbol of the Unitarian Universalist faith tradition alive in this world. Our chalice lighter today is Ten Depe. Tim is 14 years old and a soon to be high schooler living in West Seattle with his younger sister, Sarah, his cat, Felix, his two bunnies, and his parents who encourage him to get out of the house to go hike and bike around the neighborhood. He is very grateful for Kai, the exchange student from Brazil, who is staying with his family for five months. He likes to cook, but sometimes his dad has to bail him out of sticky situations. Tim plays the trumpet, ultimate frisbee, and he enjoys reading fantasy and hanging out with his friends currently reduced to video chats, watching YouTube, and playing board games with his family. Magic the Gathering and Minecraft are some of his latest obsessions. Tim has been going to Westside for about four years, and although his attendance is a little spotty, he was part of the middle school OWL program, and he enjoys being part of such a caring community. He is grateful for his teachers at Madison Middle School who work hard in these difficult times. Tim is also very ready for the pandemic to be over and can't wait to see Westside and all his other West Seattle communities return to normal. Our chalice lighting words this morning are shared by the Reverend Maureen Killerin. Let us look first to the response of love. In these hard times, let us look first to the response of love. In the midst of challenge, may our chalice flame bear witness to the inherent worth and dignity of every human being. In the midst of uncertainty, may our chalice be a beacon of encouragement that our values may guide our choices. Let us look first to the response of love. And now, dear ones, you are invited to rise in body or spirit and join us in a song for our times, hymn number 170, We Are a Gentle Angry People, words and music written by Holly New. We are a gentle angry people, and we are singing singing for our lives we are a gentle angry people and we are singing singing for our lives we are a justice seeking people and we are singing singing for our lives we are a justice seeking people and we are singing singing for our lives we are young and old together and we are singing singing for our lives we are young and old together and we are singing singing for our lives we are all genders together and we are singing singing for our lives we are all genders together and we are singing singing for our lives we are a land of men 
many colors and we are singing singing for our lives we are a land of many colors and we are singing singing for our lives we are a land of many bodies and we are singing singing for our lives we are a land of many bodies and we are singing singing for our lives we are a gentle loving people and we are singing singing for our lives we are a gentle loving people and we are singing singing for our lives indeed welcome to this west side unitarian universalist congregation if you are with us for the first time today we are so glad that you have found us in this moment please contact us via our website wsuu.org so that you can be connected more deeply with this congregation. Even as we shelter in place, even as we witness and witness and witness, we remain connected. And there are many invitations to be a part of this Unitarian Universalist community. General Assembly is the annual meeting of our Unitarian Universalist Association, scheduled to happen June 24th through 28th this year. The UUA Board of Trustees has passed a resolution to make the 2020 General Assembly 100% virtual event. So you are invited to go register today, uua.org slash GA. Westside members are invited to join in our first ever online annual meeting after the service next Sunday, June 7th, using a Zoom meeting format and Google Forms for our voting process. We will vote on our board slate, our nominating committee, and our budget. Here to tell us more about this grand adventure in faith is your faithful board president, Jade Lowry. Good morning, everyone. I'm grateful for the opportunity to make this announcement for the board. The board has been centering equity work in, our, in all of our work this year. Centering equity has focused us in several ways, prioritizing relationships over tasks, slowing down, inviting voices from the margins to be heard, being honest, and trying to be open and transparent. It's a journey. We have met goals, we've done good work, we've kept things going. We've also made mistakes and we're learning and growing. We hope that these efforts have added to Westside's strong foundation for ongoing growth. The explosiveness, the heaviness, the reality of these days reminds us that our equity work our willingness to make mistakes and our continued growth have never been more important. Our annual meeting next Sunday, June 7th is part of that call. Being part of our congregational life helps to shape us and it affects who we are in the world and in our relationships. Our congregation also reaches out into the world and the wider world needs every bit of shaping and impact we can offer. To this end, the board and the finance committee are stewarding our resources and shaping our budget to keep it strong. Hopefully you received your proposed budget along with some questions and answers to clarify things in your annual meeting email that went out last Thursday. We're offering three opportunities to meet with us about the budget this week and two are remaining. 
Tuesday evening from 6.30 to 7.30, and next Saturday morning, June 6th from 10 to 11. You will need to register so we can send you the Zoom link. And the registration link is now in the chat box, or you can always contact our office to register. But also to keep us strong, we are grateful to have a slate of new leaders prepared to do the work of navigating us through all that comes with, with the next year. We invite you as part of our solidarity as a congregation to offer what we can make, what we can to make this a better wor world. We invite you to please come together for our annual meeting. Just seeing each other's faces on Zoom will remind us of what is important. We need the strength of our collective energy now more than ever. And two practical updates. You can mark your calendars for June 28th. That's the date we're holding with hope for our transition service to honor Reverend Deanna and to welcome Reverend Christopher. We haven't received the R1 visa yet. However, USIS, the Immigration Center, is allowing requests for premium processing again starting June 8th. Premium processing does require a fee and it makes a promise of sorts to give an adjudication in 15 days. All of this to say, we're doing everything we possibly can for Reverend Christopher to join us online as soon as possible. We do have the reality that he won't be able to join us in person. However, it just so happens that we're getting better and better at online church. Our West Side leaders have been planning for what it means to possibly meet together online for most of the coming church year. The UUA has offered us wise counsel about this, and the board has found the questions for consideration that they've provided to be incredibly helpful. We'll use these questions to help us to determine when it will be best for us to open the building again. And to navigate these decisions as a community, the board is forming a COVID-19 advisory task force. We'll be inviting task force membership through the West Side Week e-news and in upcoming meetings and services. Our congregation is a treasure and the board is grateful for all the incredible support we receive. We are stronger together. Thank you. Thank you, Jade. To you and the rest of the board members for your faithful, committed leadership during these times. Uh, we offer deep gratitude to everyone who was part of the food bank effort. Your response was extraordinary and faithful. I continue to hold you in my hearts with such gratitude. Friends, you're invited to a virtual coffee hour today, immediately following the postlude. You can stay online by clicking the Zoom link that will show up in this morning's, uh, that showed up, that will show up in that chat box and was in all sorts of emails. Thank you so much, Shannon, for your communication. I also want to remind you that the Leadership Assembly will be held from one, at, beginning at one o'clock today on Zoom and with Richard Kim and Roseanne uh, leading the Vice President of your board. It will be uh, a powerful opportunity for deeper learning together, for beloved accountability, and for true faith formation leadership development. So please, uh, please do. Come back at one o'clock for the Leadership Assembly, dear leaders. One of our core values as a congregation is that we aspire to be warm and welcoming to everyone. In support of this important ministry, let us take a moment to picture the faces of our friends at Westside and to imagine the space we keep open to welcome newcomers. We want to stay connected with each other and make new connections during this virtual service. So you are invited always to type your greetings into the chat box. Let us know you're here. We send you much love. And if you wish, please take a moment to send a quick text or email or loving thought to someone you care about, especially in this moment, when many of our beloveds are still unaccounted for after yesterday's events. We are all invited to please take time to be kind with all we encounter this week, however distantly. Be in touch, friends.
Thank you for reaching out to each other, dear ones. One of the most, you'll find soon on the screen, the words of our congregational affirmation. One of the most important expressions of how we are bound together as a community of faith, children, youth, and adults, is this spoken affirmation. This is a statement of our highest values as Unitarian Universalists and the promises we make to each other at Westside to create our beloved community. Please join me in our unison affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The search for truth is our sacrament and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship. Thus do we covenant with one another. May you all feel held in love in this time. In a moment, we'll engage in a collective act of generosity known as the offering, where we take time to actively support Westside Unitarian Universalist congregation with our gifts by text or by check. This week in Minneapolis, there occurred yet another egregious case of police brutality and overreach resulting in the death of a black person in this country. George Floyd, we will say his name. And in Tallahassee, Tony McDade. And in Louisville, Breonna Taylor. The rate at which unarmed black Americans are killed by police is more than twice as high as the rate for white Americans. And this has been true for decades by now, centuries. As our Unitarian Universalist Association president, the Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Gray says, people of faith, particularly those of us who are white progressives, need to combat the systems of criminalization in our country. Systems of policing and criminalization in this country are inherently violent. Witness, my friends, steeped in and created to reinforce white supremacy, anti-blackness and racialized control. On this fifth Sunday in the month of May, we are donating one third of our plate collection to the Minnesota Freedom Criminal Bail Fund that pays criminal bail and immigration, bo and immigration bonds for those who cannot afford to. There have been unprecedented numbers of arrests for people who have been unheard for their whole lives protesting against injustice. By supporting this bail fund, we seek to end discriminatory, coercive and oppressive arrests and jailing. This service is our prayer in action towards a vision of collective liberation. And you are invited to give by text this morning, 888-530-9056. A note from Shannon that if you need to update your payment information, simply text edit to that same number, 888-530-9056. We thank you for your generosity in helping to sustain our beloved community and to live into a vision a beloved community. Our gift of song is Come Healing by Leonard Cohen, performed and shared by the First Unitarian Congregational Society in Brooklyn, New York. I am so grateful for our congregational sharing among Unitarian Universalist congregations, living faithfully into the discipline of the Cambridge Platform of 1648 in this emergent time. Come Healing. Healing of the mind And let the heavens 
Thank you, beloveds, for your spiritual practice of generosity and hope this morning. Spirit of life and love, I invite you to take a breath in, beloveds, and enter with me into a spirit of prayer as I share a prayer adapted by the Reverend Paul Beadle, First Unitarian Universalist Church of New Orleans. Spirit of life and love, justice and peace, today we count over 100,000 deaths in our country from this COVID pandemic. That is, those of us who are still counting. We have in our country about 4% of the world's population and yet nearly a third of the world's confirmed cases of COVID-19 nearly a third of the world's deaths from it, say those of us who are still tracking the statistics. More and more of us though, are tracking loved ones who have died, the spouse, the parent, the sister, the niece, the patient, the neighbor, the coworker, the friend, these outweigh all percentages. And in the midst of this, the disease of racism, continues to ravage this country, stealing the lives of beloveds. Our fear gives way to grief. And when we grieve, things don't go back to normal quickly. We need time to take time to grieve. If we don't, grief turns into trauma. And when the next occasion for grief comes, as it will, for that is a part of life. We will be less able, possibly unable, to process it. This is true for us individually and collectively. There will be no back to normal until we have grieved. And then it will not be back to normal, but on to a new normal, as it always is with grief, as it always is with hope. Come what may, O oh spirit of life, may we slow down and take time to grieve. May we slow down and take time to witness each other's grief. And may we slow down and consider what kind of new normal we really want and really want to work toward. In the spirit, by the spirit, with the spirit giving power, so may it be. Amen. Each week we come together as a congregation to connect and share that which matters to us. At this time, we make collective space for holding our joys and sorrows. From Neve Azik Bianco, this sorrow. My dear friend and comrade, Stacy Park Milborn, died from post-surgical complications on her 33rd birthday, May 13th. She was a fearless, loving leader in the disability justice movement. And her legacy includes turning her home into the Disability Justice Culture Club. She is fiercely missed. We hold you in our hearts. On this day, we grieve. Brianna Taylor. Tony McDade, George Floyd, the fear of everyone for themselves and their children who cannot trust that it will be safe for them to walk or roll down the streets. We lift up in this time of sorrow that Black lives matter, disabled lives matter, indigenous lives matter, immigrant lives matter. We bear witness to the sorrows of this world. At this time, let us hold in our hearts the joys and sorrows, both known and unknown, of this beloved community. And let us trust that there is a love. <laughs>
out. We hold in our hearts those perceived as Asian and Asian American who are being held up as targets of hate and scapegoating. We hold in our hearts all who have been misgendered, all the violence, the perceptions of difference. This morning, our meditation on shared compassion invites us to stretch in the spirit of love and justice. So breathing in, stretch up as this is available to you, stretch up to the sky, to the ceiling, to all that is possible for wisdom and inspiration, for the gifts of our ancestors, for the hopes of our young, for the wisdom of our elders. And then you're invited to stretch down to the ground, to the front lines, to those most infirstly impacted, stretching down. And then, as you're able, twist to the side, let your arms flow with the winds of change that are blowing, blowing. And then, as it is available to you, stomp your feet or bounce your hands, clap. Ah, letting loose all your energy, all your energy of hope towards calling justice forth in this world. So I invite you again, stretching up and down, blowing with courage and the winds of change, dancing, dancing for call to justice. And then breathing in and out as you can, wrapping your arms around you or holding your elbows, touching your hand, holding your heart. Breathing in and out. May you be held in love. May you hold all in love. Our reading this morning is shared by Side with Love campaign manager, Everett R.H. Thompson. What it means to side with love. To side with love means to me, dignity. It means justice. It means belonging. It means safety. It means that as much as we fight so that we can make sure that our homes are safe and that whoever wants to come to be with us and cross borders, that they too bring their dignity with them. It means that as we think about the rise of mass incarceration, that we can actually be free without cages and that people, wherever they are, deserve dignity. It means that as we fight on the streets to make sure that we can love who we want to love, that love is for everyone and love can resist all the hate that they throw at us. But most importantly, it means that when we are tired, when we feel like no one is listening to us, that we are not alone, that we are part of a large movement. And history has proven that as we continue to do this work, as we know that we have freedom and freedom is in our veins, that we too can fight, we can be, and we can side on this side, on this day, with a higher being, with a higher place for the sake of our own dignity, but most importantly, for our own liberation. So. Side with love is, is is what it's about right now and what it will be, what it will be about for future generations to come. May we choose to side with love. And we offer gratitude for the beautiful gift of our anthem this morning, We Rise. The music and lyrics by Daryl Grant from a poem written by the Reverend William Sinkford, former president of our Unitarian Universalist Association. I'd like to commend to y'all Skinner House Books Meditation Manual, edited by Reverend Sinkford, titled To Wake, To Rise. Today's anthem is sung and shared by the Love Bigger Virtual Choir with soloist Marilyn Keller. We rise.
There is no uncertainty about the suffering around us. Nor uncertainty that the worst is still days ahead for us. The possible futures we face never included an absence of suffering. But the possibilities for how we move through this time are many. And it is in the choices that we make that glimpses of hope can be found. is that we will accept these evils as the best that we can do. But that is not the only possibility. There is another. There is another. There is another. There is another. The possibility that love might just prove to be real. And prove to be resilient. And stronger in the end than our self-interests and our failings. This time, the circle can't be broken. The time is now, at last. We can rise. By sharing what we have, prioritizing connection, imagining new possibilities, and standing for justice. We can choose compassion, honor those whom we have lost, expand community, and rebuild trust in one another. We can love bigger. It's already happening. The seeds of this new direction are being planted all around us. Now is our time. Rise up, brand new day. Rise up, brand new day.
Friends, it is my honor and joy to welcome Richard Kim to share with us in this together. Welcome, Richard. Friends, I'm grateful to be here with you today. Um, and as I've sat with you this morning, I'm reminded of just the close proximity of hope and despair. Uh, like many of you, um, I've been overwhelmed with emotion this week. Um, and it's been a challenge to bring a word to you at this time uh, when many cities throughout our nation are burning. In the midst of an ongoing global pandemic and the succession of events that has led to ongoing protests, another dark chapter in our history uh, you know, is being lived out. As people cry out uprisings throughout this country and around the world, uh, we all should be close to our margins. Our system was already stressed. Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and now George Floyd. The broadcast of the death of George Floyd by Minneapolis police officers provided an opportunity for this country to witness yet again a moment that erupted uh, you know, many in our nation the daily lived reality of people who are oppressed and marginalized within a racialized and biased system continues to be exposed. They rightfully cry out, will I be next and do I matter? Minneapolis is home for me. It was the place of my birth. Uh, it was where I returned to go to college. And this past week, I have found myself grieving with the city and the people uh, who are there, uh, both friends and family who continue to live there. And I implore you to hear their cry and the cry of so many others. And I think back to my own story, I think about the story of my father. He came to this country from South Korea in the early 1970s and settled in, of all places, the Twin Cities. From a very early age, when I was born, I became aware of my difference. I often found myself as the only person of color throughout most of my early life. And I'm sure that uh, because I was often singular, the only one, um, I easily became the exception in the eyes of those around me. I was undoubtedly seen, but often unacknowledged in my uniqueness and therefore overlooked in my potential challenges. And as a young person, I was encouraged to fit in equally by my parents and my teachers. And I wonder if that offered them relief from a hard conversation or potentially being disappointed or condemned uh, in my experiences. But like most young people, I yearn for acceptance and affirmation and I learned to appeal to my white neighbors and friends, to the white teachers, coaches, Cub Scout leaders, uh, to affirm my goodness and to show me uh, that I was loved. And I became very well adjusted and did not know to want anymore. It was not until I was confronted by my need to be accepted and seen as good that I began to question the lessons that I learned long ago Watching the images on the TV screen this past week uh, took me back uh, to one of the first instances uh, that I recalled um, being questioned about race and identity in my experience. And that was, uh, again, another uprising moment in our country, uh, the Los Angeles riots back in 1992. As a young 12 year old, uh, I began to see uh, you know, the riots unfold. And I began to notice these images uh, at that time of Korean store owners standing on rooftops, uh, protecting their businesses with guns um, and engaging uh, those community members uh, that were erupted uh, by the incidences surrounding Rodney King. And as a young person, I was susceptible uh, to internalizing those images. Uh, but for the first time, in my life, I felt woven into the larger narrative of race in America. 
And for most of my life, uh, I was left to wonder by outside messages and images that I saw, stories that I heard, uh, but I left, you know, was left not knowing for my own self how my own story was woven into that bigger picture. And because of that, it was hard for me to connect with the pain of others, to look at that moment through the eyes of others who were suffering differently than myself. And in particular, uh, to confront my own pain. Uh, I had always been told and been shown uh, that my value was in the eyes and the, and the opinions of those outside of myself. Um, and for most of my life, uh, I was susceptible to that message. In this day and age, we find ourselves at a moment in this country of being exposed. Uh, this pandemic has exposed us. Uh, an officer who showed callous indifference to his actions ignited a community who was already feeling the disproportionate effect of the global pandemic. Black and brown people who are already exposed when deemed essential uh, were left uh, to go and suffer the exposure of a potential pandemic. Again, this pandemic exposed us, exposed those underlying systems and structures that had already created differences in spite of the impact of this pandemic. As I prepared for this message, um, I originally came uh, really attuned to the impact of this COVID-19 pandemic uh, on the Asian American community. Uh, as an Asian American myself, but more so now as a parent to two young children, uh, I carried the burden of not knowing uh, whether any time I ventured out of my home, uh, whether or not I would be confronted uh, by the fear, anxiety, animosity of another, uh, who I know feels helpless, uh, but also at the same time, especially again as a parent to two young children, uh, feel the potential trauma uh, that that restlessness, that cry, that need to shed this anxiety outside of my own body uh, could potentially have on myself or more so my kids. I also recognize that within this year, we continue to have questions of immigrants and who is American and who belongs, uh, who are we fundamentally. All of these experiences for me are related and connected. And I need us to be able to see the connections between these events. Not long ago, uh, when my oldest son was three years old, uh, I found myself, we found ourselves sitting next to each other uh, on a summer day. And he happened to glance down at my knee and notice a small scar. And he asked me, Appa, what is that? And I told him it was a scar from when I fell off my skateboard uh, at an age not much older than he was at that time. So he began reflecting on uh, that story. His eyes drew to other scars throughout my body and called me back to those stories that were so formative in my life, but more so the moments beyond those scars that continued to form uh, and be carried with me, like those marks on my body. My son at that time reminded me of the resilience that my body carries, uh, but also the tenuous relationship between hope and despair. As a person of faith, uh, I was often drawn to stories of unfailing love and the notion that love has to be as strong as death. And I'm reminded again this morning again of the tenuous nature and the close proximity of hope and despair. I wanna invite us again, as we've done several times this morning uh, to join together as a community in breath, to begin to pay attention to the air that is coming into our body and being exhaled, to breathe in deeply 
and to exhale intentionally. In spite of being here in the beautiful Northwest, we are all living in an age uh, where the air itself can feel like a threat. Uh, reading through an article from uh, this past week, uh, I read these words, racism in America is like dust in the air. It seems invisible, even if you're choking on it. And until you let the sun in, then you see it everywhere. As long as we keep shining that light, we have a chance of cleaning it wherever it lands. But we have to stay vigilant because it's always still in the air. Beloved community, these words I'm reminded of, uh, you know, because my body needs them to be true. I need to know that we are connected together in spite of uh, being at home. I need to know that you are a community uh, who feels and knows that they are beloved in spite of a world that is trying to tell you otherwise. My body needs to know that there is hope for us and that there is a peace that can draw us together in mutuality, in dignity. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it was back in graduate school uh, when I was broke open. Uh, and really the story that, uh, you know, the question uh, that broke me open uh, came through a witness from a unrelenting friend. Um, and it was this witness as I struggled and wrestled with the story that I was trying to wrestle with of examining my life, of reflecting on my experience, of preparing myself to care for others as a pastor, uh, that someone stopped me, invited me to be still, and bore witness to the tension and the tiredness and the weariness that I was holding in my body. Uh, it was a simple phrase. You, mu you look tired. What is going on with you? A simple question. And for a number of different reasons in that moment, uh, my body, my spirit broke open. Uh, for the first time in my life, I experienced a sense of being seen, a sense of being known in a way that up until that point, I'd never realized before. And I believe that there are so many in our community and in our midst that have yet to feel that relief of being seen and understood. So much of this understanding can only come when we ourselves are willing to look at those scars in our body and to realize, maybe even question, whether or not we individually have that resilience. And ultimately we have to know that we alone can't do it by ourselves. We are living in a threshold moment. As I listen to the background noise of my home, my children playing downstairs, I wonder, I fear about their future. I sense the tension in my body and I witness the cry of the people around me. And I feel a cry Walling up in my own body. And need to trust that a spirit, that people, that something is there to bear witness to that. And I believe, I need to believe. that that witness is there 
for me and for us all. In the midst of violence, trauma, hurt and despair, we cannot call for peace without calling for justice. For peace in hindsight offers little restoration for those who are struggling for a hope. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to be here with you. Uh, and in this moment, I want to invite us all once again to pay attention to breath, to feel that breath in connection with others, to allow that rhythm to at least for a moment offer a sense of peace without ignoring the cry that stirs in the world and hopefully within our own bodies. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you. Grateful for the opportunity to return to this community with you. Um, and again, to be with you this afternoon during the leadership assembly. Um, I pray that for those who are hurting, uh, that you find peace and that peace and justice come quickly to our community and to our world. Thank you all. Thank you for the gift of your presence. We honor you today. Beloveds, we invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing our sending hymn number 1017, Building a New Way, May It Be So, written by Work of the Weavers member Martha Sanderfer. We are building a new way. Building a new way. We are building a new way, feeling stronger every day. We are building a new way. We are working to working to be free we are working to be free hate and greed and jealousy we are working to be free we can free and freedom is our cry without these this world will die peace and freedom is our cry we are building a new way we are building
still. We release the flame this morning with a benediction shared by the Reverend Mary Catherine Morn, president of our Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, the UUSC, about which we'll learn more next week. In the spirit of activist and author Rebecca Solnit, when our dreams, our hopes for a better future cause them to admonish us to be reasonable, don't listen, don't stop, don't let your dream shrink by one inch. Don't forget, this might be the day and the pivotal year when we rewrite what is possible. With imagination and hope, with courage, May we build a new world. Beloved, you're invited to rise, embody your spirit, and connect for our closing fivefold amen. Let us sing together now. you're invited to enjoy a postlude gift of come down O love divine for this for those in the western christian tradition is pentecost sunday when the spirit of love descended it is played by john hansen and we give thanks for your gifts you're invited to join in virtual coffee hour as you're willing and able by clicking on the link provided in the chat box and in the worship blast sent to you this morning there is a separate link if you wish to join in conversation at a virtual table with your West Side board members, the lay leaders who have given so many loving gifts of service and care during this year as we prepare for our first ever annual congregation meeting next Sunday. And all congregational leaders and those called to leadership are invited to join in our West Side Leadership Assembly on Zoom beginning at 1 p.m. today. And we give thanks to Richard Ken for joining us in this time. Beloved, our time together here may be ending, but our call to service in the world has only begun. May you leave this space with a heart of resilient peace and compassion, ready to love the hell out of this world. I thank you for being a part of this faith community, and I carry you in my heart.